fine. It's been, um, the thing that I find really odd is um, when normally we do these webinars, it's dark outside. <laughs> I know, that's true. I was thinking that. <laughs> it's, it's, really, really, it's really sunny, isn't it? Yeah. So I don't um, know if that might, weird. might put a few people off since it's such a nice evening. It might do, I suppose. That's the thing. It's really nice. Actually, it's a lot nicer this evening than it was um, uh, like this. Well, it's been nice all day, actually. I can't complain. Yeah. It's um, pretty a nice more settled here. and warm. Yeah. We've well, got not really very far, you're about a mile away from me. I know. <laughs> There's been lots of uh, butterflies coming out on the kind of sunny rides around oh, our way, which oh, is nice. really nice. You know, when it's I have seen orange tip butterflies today for the first time this year. I don't oh, know about you. Yeah. 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 No, I haven't, I haven't seen any orange tip, but we've seen peacocks and small oh. tortoise shells. So oh, that's nice. Oh, I think we've got um, a few people starting to oh, arrive. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Okay, that's good. Good evening, um, everybody. If you're just if you're just joining us, we're just waiting for um, a few more people to to kind of get in through the waiting room before we start. But feel free to put in the chat whereabouts you're joining us from tonight. If, yeah, that's interesting. Because last time we've we've had people from all over the world, haven't we? So yeah. I wonder if geology make, means that people come from far afield or not. Yeah. Really or not? Mm, be interesting study, wouldn't it, to find I out? Suppose it, it depends how far um, we've managed to. To kind of get the word out that it's on tonight, I suppose we'll, we'll soon mm. see. I wonder um, what which of our webinars has attracted the most exotic audience. <laughs> that, would be, that would be oh, skin Vanessa oh, always. Skin Vanessa. Skin Vanessa. Well, that's definitely the most exotic. Um, oh, we've North got someone from North Cheshire in Manchester who loves the Solway, so that's even better. <laughs> oh, and I'm great. I'm based in Dumfries, and you're just across the water, aren't you, Naomi? Yep, I'm based in Bowness near Bowness and Solway, so yeah um so you know yeah it's good it's nice to see yeah because <laughs> i suppose the problem is when you do it like an actual event you, you tend to attract quite a local audience don't you i know it's saying the yeah uh, the obvious but oh but i'm lucky with us from plumland hi Anne. oh hi Anne. Marlin. oh brilliant okay so marlin just on the road from me <laughs> <laughs> so it's all your neighbors actually <laughs> my neighbors are here. <laughs> good. Cuckoo, a cuckoo brie. excellent oh like okay it. yeah so all around the coast so far, or mostly. Yeah, that's good. Oh, okay, we've got another local other Dumfriesa. Dumfriesa, yeah. I think I made that word up actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, that's great. Yeah, we're quite a few people there. here. Yeah, I don't know whether um whether it'll put people off because the weather's so nice, but um I'm not I'm not sure. It depends whether people have been doing the same as me and sitting in front of the computer all day. I know. <laughs> I must admit, I have I have pretty much mostly as well. So. I know, that's right, but oh, Phil's uh, messaged as well, so that was good. Yeah. One of our speakers <laughs> is definitely with us and hasn't dropped off. <laughs> Excellent, we've got Hi, oh. Christy. Christy's a regular yeah. and we've talked so very yeah. Ball, so that's good. Yeah, we've got some oh, good things. I bet it's looking lovely in Maryport oh. tonight, actually, out to sea. It'll be really yeah. pretty, won't it? I think the sun, because my uh, window looks out across um, to the west as well, so um, kind of hoping that we'll get a nice sunset as I'm hearing yeah. about geology. So do you, so. Most, do you see the sunsets then from yeah. yours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing sunsets. I mean, it, you know, not as amazing as people live in Skimberness and Mary Port uh -huh. and get that beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, I'm not on a, quite on the coast, but um, yeah. Nan said there's been some wonderful sunsets, so. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just, I think, with it being so clear and quite cold at night as well, it's yeah. really nice, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's been funny weather though, hasn't it? We always, um, yeah. We always talk about the weather, don't we? And then we get stuck, don't we? Because we end up getting into technicalities <laughs> with the weather that we can't answer. So we must have fallen that trap again. <laughs> but actually, the weather just now is the same as it was this time last year. So when we went into kind of lockdown last oh, yeah. year, then yeah. actually we had this big, long, dry spell in this yeah. part of the, the country. And um, and it went on for ages. It was because then remember yeah. kind of like the garden getting really, really dry and having to start watering things. Well, I've been watering my plants just because we haven't really had a lot of rain for a yeah. while. I mean, that's one or two that were starting to wilt. Um, and I've just I planted some rhubarb not long ago, and I'm obsessed with it. Oh. Might not survive. Yeah. I love rhubarb. Oh, um, me so too. It's <laughs> Especially in a gin. <laughs> in a gin <laughs> as well. Yes, in a gin. The botanical um, health oh. drinks, as we like to call them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's half past, but we're just going to give people a few more minutes to to kind of get through the the waiting room, as it were. And, uh, and we'll we'll start. Just give it another five minutes before we kick off. It sounds quite funny when you say get through the waiting room like the hurdle to cross. You know, like it a just sort kind of, of reminds me of 
reminds me of going to the dentist, but hopefully not quite like that. that. <laughs> I, used to, I used to work at Beamish Museum. More... I used to work in a dentist, so there was always. Oh, did you? Oh. Yeah. So uh, when he said not... waiting room, I had pictured that waiting room. Oh, not as the dentist, I hope. <laughs> or yeah, I, yeah, I, did, I used to work. I used to work in the dentists as part of the at Beamish. But what did you do? Uh, I used to be in period costume. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, uh, see, right, lots right. Of things like talking to talking to us as, as you can imagine, spend the so whole day. So with a pair of a pair of pliers or something to take people's teeth all out. So, all sorts of tools. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a joke from pull you the one from one of our. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, there was all sorts of amazing, um, terrible kind of implements. Um, oh. Not terrible implements, but um, yeah, it was re really interesting to look at the developments or. I think that would. I think that's that horrible. I can't think of anything worse. Someone just said the dentist stories of Beamish terrified my. Yeah, body. <laughs> I report. I know. I I've got I've got horrible dentist stories of my own. Far less going to see kind of you know oh dear. what tools they used to use. Don't yeah, no. <laughs> some things haven't changed though. Um, there's some tools that were actually haven't haven't changed. You know, like some of the kind of shapes of the pliers. Oh, um, maybe we should change. change. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're going to lose all of our um, audience now. Are we so much on how we got oh, onto that? <laughs> so, if you have joined us, we have we aren't um, having a talk on dentistry tonight. We are we are having a, a webinar on uh, geology of the Solway, but we're just giving it a few more minutes to let some of the people get in. We've got quite a few people here so far, which is pretty good because, yeah. it is a, as we've already said several times, it's a sunny evening. <laughs> <laughs> and if you haven't told us where you're joining us from, feel free to put in the chat um, to, so we can see who's the from the furthest away. I think in some of the webinars we've had in the past, we've had people joining us from America. And um, I think, it was I think we've got all Solway. We've got, um, no, no, we've yeah. got someone from Durham, I think, haven't we? I think we, I think we said there was someone from Durham. Um, yeah, so we seem to have more of a local, local-ish audience so far. Yeah, so far, that's good. Certainly, well yeah, scattered around the Solway, though. Yeah, no, that's really good. Um, I have to confess that I um, I have actually cut my fringe myself. <laughs> just for this I hadn't noticed, so it was, you've done quite well. I don't really apologise now. <laughs> Did my fringe just set anyone? But I just thought <laughs> the lack of going to a hairdresser. Oh, we've got some of American oh. Northern Arkansas. Hello. Oh, well, that's great. Betsy. Hi, although, Betsy. Been, although I don't know whether people are make, start making things up just to keep us happy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Actually. <laughs> so hi from, from Northern Arkansas. <laughs> I can't even Mary Porter from Book B. That's great. Hi, yeah. We've got a few Mary Porters, haven't we, on the yeah. old uh, webinar? So that's good. Mm. Um, so, yeah. yeah um, the numbers are numbers are still going up. So, like I say, we'll literally just give it another couple of minutes, and then we'll kick off. We're live streaming it on Facebook as well, so um, yeah, that's good. I think um, we tend to find um, that um, someone from from Yorkshire, from Bingley, oh, excellent. Great. Um, tend to find that a lot of people are watching. Are watching it afterwards sometimes or um on yeah. facebook live because it's easier than kind of having to go through booking a ticket but um i don't know everyone likes different ways of joining in on something don't they so yeah no yeah. absolutely yeah yeah just depends i guess doesn't it really so um so have you been to the hairdressers yet <laughs> <I've been talking laughs> about dentistry next week. And not a hair appointment. <laughs> i have got an appointment for next week so oh, yeah okay. things are things are starting to get quite out of control but <laughs> Um, and end is in sight. You're very neat. <laughs> Anyways, these are the main. I think the problem is when I go to get it cut, basically it'll just unearth much more grey hair. So in some ways, it's not such Surely a thing. Surely not. Just kind of, <laughs> yeah, always a bit I found some grey hairs. Yeah, it's scary, isn't it? I found some grey hairs the other day that I'm sure I hadn't had before. <laughs> so, but um, I thought, well, it's the Solway <laughs> working on the Solway for you. It's working on the Solway for us. It's stress free. <laughs> No, it's lovely. It's lovely. We're very lucky, aren't we? We're very lucky. Yeah, no, it's great, actually. I was going to say, I think we've maybe um, stuck now at numbers, but actually it's just gone up a bit more. So. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, we've got a little, little flurry there, haven't we? So. Yeah. If we give another minute till 25 yeah, to then we'll, we'll get started. We'll Sorry, yeah. you have to put up with our, our, our chatter before you get into a <laughs> talk. It's, a, it's nice for us to have a little catch up anyway, Claire, isn't it? So. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and actually, so nice for Monday, from Monday, we're allowed yes. to cross the border as well. Oh. Dion Lackey's comment about grey hair. He said what you're talking about, she says. 
That's why we laugh. That's why we laugh. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Well, that's uh, 25 too. So rather than yeah. kind of um, hang around too much longer, I think we'll, we'll just kick off if everybody's okay with that. So um, welcome to the Shaping of the Solway Coast webinar. Um, if you don't know, I'm Claire McFarlane and I'm the Partnership Manager at Solway Firth Partnership. And this is my colleague across the Solway, Naomi Kay, who's the manager of the Solway Coast Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. So we started doing these joint webinars um, because we weren't able to get together to hold our annual conference, our biannual conference. Um, and we would normally use that conference to celebrate the Solway Firth and the cultural and heritage of the marine and coastal environment. And we've obviously discussed a few topics already through our webinars and because they've been so well received, we thought we'd continue. Um, and this is actually going to be the, the last one before the summer. So it's really good that we've got the kind of um, geology aspect of it. Now, we've only run a few of these before, obviously, over the winter. So just bear with us if we do have any glitches um, with the technology. But we have got Anna behind the scenes to help us with that. So hopefully it'll be OK. <laughs> So if you, want to know anything, yeah, if you want to know anything else about our organisations, then please visit our websites and you can see about some of the projects that we've been working on and all the resources that we have. And there's lots of great images of the Solway. So, um, you know, please do have a look. Um, and I'll now hand you over to Naomi. So um, apologies to those people who've been to every webinar and know exactly how this works. <laughs> I'm just going to run through the, the technicalities, really, for anybody who isn't that familiar with Zoom. Um, so this is, um, we run on a webinar function on Zoom. So it just means that um, you, you don't have to mess around with your camera or video. It, they'll automatically be switched off. Um, but we do want you to participate. Most of you have, dis have discovered that already. Um, there is a chat option. It should be probably at the bottom of your screen. And you can post comments and observations to everybody in the webinar. So please do use this because we really enjoy it as well. Um, just click on it to bring up the chat window and type away. Um, only thing to notice uh, to note is that if you're posting a comment, just make sure that you select the option um, at the bottom, all panelists and attendees instead of just all panelists, or your comments will just be seen by the speakers um, and not by everyone, which um, isn't quite as, as good. Um, but we also have a questions and answers option as a button down there as well on your screen. Um, if you've got questions for the speakers, please post them into the Q&A section. Um, and then at the end, like we've done with every webinar, we'll um, choose um, some of them, as many as possible, um, and ask our speakers to have a go answering them. So please do use that. And if you can try and keep it to the Q&A section rather than the chat, that helps us kind of, you know, we don't get confused, <laughs> which could happen. <laughs> Um, and then just a final note is that this session is currently being live streamed on Facebook um, and it's been recorded as well. Um, and that will it, it will be available in due course on both the Solway Firth Partnership and the AOMB YouTube channels. Um, so uh, there's plenty of time to have a watch of it afterwards um, or share it with your friends. So it's now time um, to move on to introduce our two speakers. So we have Phil Davis and Nick Coombe, who are both going to do um, about 20 minutes or so each. Um, Phil um, has a particular interest in Lake District geology, so he's a member of the Cumberland Geological Society and also a fellow of the Geological Society of London. In 2018, he published Geology in the Lake District National Park, which encourages readers to visit geo sites to examine features that illustrate what he says of the epic history of Lakeland, which is a great term. Um, he provides lots of talks to U3A groups and others on geological topics, a um, wide range of them from, from time to time. So he's, he's pretty experienced in doing a, a talk. Um, so Nick uh, Coombe is a landscape architect who over the last 10 years has worked on lots and lots of Solway Firth partnership projects across along the Scottish side of the Solway. Um, so the edge where the land meets the sea, as you will probably all agree, is a dynamic place. And Nick is really fascinated by the geological processes that have shaped the, the seashore, um, but also the resources it provides. Um, again, Nick has given talks on a right, wide range of topics, um, and um, he's got a great amount of experience visiting the coast over many years uh, for wildflowers to place names. And he's always found that geology provides the foundations to everything we see. So a good starting point um, from there. Um, so we're going to start with Phil first, so um, I'm now going to hand over to him, let him switch on his sound and camera. Here he is, was a cue. We will then depart and we'll let Phil share his screen. Hello, Phil. Hi, hi Naomi, <laughs> thanks for that. Thanks for inviting me to do this and uh, maybe not so much thanks for setting the bar so high about... Um, anyway, uh, let's have a go. Just bear with me while I do the share screen. If you somebody give me a shout when you've got it, please.
Yep, that's up, Phil. Very good. Okay. Okay. Slideshow. My computer's running nice and slow, which is always great fun, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. I'm Phil Davis. Uh, I'm a member of the Cumberland Geological Society and uh, very keen on Lake District geology. Basically, I live nearby. I spend a lot of time uh, slogging around uh, the rocks here. Just on this opening slide, I'd point you to the Solway Firth Partnerships website. It's got rather a good section on geology. Um, and I hope I don't contradict it too much tonight. I don't think I will. Um, but there is quite a good um, summary there. So there's the Solway in the middle. There's North. Um, and uh, I'll show you a better picture in a second. So my job tonight is to talk about the English side, uh, let's call it the southern side of the Solway, which runs from bottom right here up to the central part of the picture and then swings around the corner um, towards uh, Port Carlisle and so on. That's where we are, so oblique Google Earth view. And I think it shows the scene, uh, sets the scene rather nicely. I'm just uh, outside Cockermouth here. And my Lake District Fells, you can see there across uh, on the right. So what I'm going to do uh, is, excuse me on this, I'm going to start off with a technical bit and I'm going to end the talk with a technical bit. And the middle bit, I hope, is a bit less technical. Um, but anyway, there's a good question about why is the Solway here at all? I mean, why do we have this great lump of Scotland, this great lump of England and the wet bit in between? Part of the story is about the Earth's crust as it widens and subsides uh, and you get faults along the basin margin. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, and basically a bit of the crust is somewhat lower than the land around it. You've got the Irish Sea Basin, uh, which is another subsiding area, and the Solway Basin is kind of an offshoot of the Irish Sea Basin. Over time, layers of sedimentary rock accumulate in these basins, um, but there's a long history of subsidence and sedimentation over 250 million years. So there's lots of geological processes of subsidence, sedimentation, uplift and erosion, and uh, I just ask you to bear that complex stuff in mind. Don't get too frightened by the next picture. Okay, this is a, a geological cross section. Geologists love cross sections of things. So you can see a 10 kilometer bar across the bottom. So it's about 40 or 50 kilometers wide. This is uh, the North Channel to the Isle of Man. It doesn't really matter. It just shows the idea of a, a subsiding basin. So you can see this is, uh, these are thousands of meters down the side. So it's an exaggerated scale. But all these basins, like the Solway Basin, sink. The crust sinks, basically, because it's in tension. And you get all these faults. You see these geological faults here. And layers and layers of sedimentary rock build up in the middle. And just now, uh, our bit in the middle is, is wet. It's the Solway. But that's a sedimentary basin. Rather a technical slide. And I promise uh, I'll, I won't do that to you again until we get to the back end of this. The final landform that we see around here, I think most people are aware, was sculpted by the Ice Age. With multiple phases of Ice Age, actually, over the last two and a half million years, the last lot only retreated maybe 10,000 years ago from the upland parts of the Lake District and presumably the upland parts of southern Scotland as well. But you can see these all these exciting arrows showing uh, ice sweeping around. And you can imagine that actually the Solway must have captured a lot of ice and swept it out into this big Irish sea ice sheet that went charging down uh, the Cumbrian and Lancashire coast. So that's the last big geological impact that's given us the shape of the land that we see today. Talk about rocky foundations here. Um, geologists look at the world in two parts, really. They think about bedrock, and you know bedrock when you hit it, it's hard stuff. And then superficial deposits, mostly soils, and most of you know what soils are. That's a simple division. Geologists already also start at the oldest and work younger. So we start at the bottom here. And the Lake District rocks are nearly 500 million years old. They come close to the Solway. Uh, they get a mention here because they, they, uh, they, they're close to my heart. And they're rather similar in age to some of the rocks you'll hear about later from Nick in southern Scotland as well. The next big group of rocks is the Carboniferous and the clues in the name. We get all the coal measures. Um, they're a uh, strong feature of the West Cumbrian uh, landscape or terrain. Then we have the Triassic uh, moving into dinosaur territory, um, 200 million years ish, sandstone, shale, salts. These blanket the Solway uh, offshore, the Solway seabed below the seabed. 
But those are the kind of bedrock units that we're going to talk about. And I hope you've got some of the ideas of age. 500 million years, we don't actually see them on the coast, up to about 200 million years, which we do see on the coast. Then there's a huge break with lots of geological history, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, we get the much younger sediments of the Quaternary, the Ice Age, glacial sediments. The Solway Peat, uh, which features in the AONB, um, is only about 10,000 years old, which is not much to a geologist. Um, and I also like to include things like windblown sand, mobile marine deposits, salt flats, and alluvium. They're all geological formations, and they do play a bit of the story, a bit in the story of the Solway. Okay, this is a, a look along the English coast from St. Bee's Head, and um, I just like the picture. Uh, it disappears, Solway disappears into the mist as we get around the corner towards Port Carlisle over here. But um, you can see the town of Whitehaven, Workington, and Silleth. They're the local, local milestones. And Carlisle's over here in the murk somewhere. So uh, I don't want you to be too put off by this one. Um, it's a geological map published by the Geological Survey in the UK. And it shows lots of different colors. Um, uh, ridiculously enough, it looks like the geology stops at the coast. I mean, the geology doesn't know the difference. Of course, it carries on under the sea, but many maps just do stop at the coast because it's difficult to map under the sea. Um, but what we've got here, I like to point out that all this gray stuff is the Ordovician, uh, ancient Lake District rocks, um, which start just uh, sort of southeast of Cockermouth. Then we have this pink stuff. Um, well, getting an age, get an age sequence. But all the grey stuff in here is the Carboniferous, including the coal measures, and the pink stuff is the Triassic bedrock, which is uh, St. Bee's Head and down the coast, and running right up uh, over, over towards Carlisle, Longtown, and round into Scotland, actually. So those are the formations. All these little other little lines are geological faults. Uh, you can see uh, geologists decided which ones to put on the map. There's millions of faults around. They just try and put the ones that seem interesting on this map. One thing I would point out is that the English side looks totally different from the Scottish side, in colour at least. And we'll perhaps get onto that a little bit later on. Um, but there's a dramatic difference between the two sides of the Solway. So if you can just carry that forward, please. So just a, I'll just dwell on the Skiddle groups. It's my favourite uh, rock formation. And this is my, my stomping ground, Bassensweight Lake. And uh, the, the foreground rocks here are the Skiddaw sedimentary rocks laid down off an ancient continent about 480 odd million years ago here. And then the volcanics are behind. I'm not going to talk about them too much. It's just to give a little bit of a hook between those ancient rocks approaching, well, over 400 million years old on both sides of the Solway. And I quite like the picture. Okay. The Solway coast, certainly at the seaward end or the Irish Sea end is dominated by uh, industrial development really. And the big one has got to be the coal measures which run from Whitehaven to Maryport. And you can see them as gray and light gray, dark gray uh, kind of features on here. Broadly speaking, I have to speak with a broad brush here, obviously. So coal measures, fantastic. Um, there's the old Woodhouse colliery south of Whitehaven um, before it closed. And you can just see a tremendous thickness of um, productive coal there. This thing went out under the sea. So it's a real coastal um, a coastal story. And uh, you see the hydraulic props there. People are interested to hold the roof up. I won't go into mining techniques. I'm not an expert. Just a reminder of the industrial significance uh, of Whitehaven, this major port in its day uh, with coal mines uh, on, the, on top of the hill here at Kells, uh, this Hague pit. You see the winding gear and things. Carboniferous rocks, a round number, let's call it 300 million years. Very few good outcrops, actually. Um, there are some uh, along these, these cliffs here, but I don't have any pictures of, of the outcrops of the rock. But anyway, Carboniferous played a huge part in the development of uh, West Cumbria. Jumping forward now to this uh, roughly 200 million year number, the Triassic sandstones at uh, St. Bees, and they're, they're displayed fantastically well on the foreshore at Maryport by the promenade. Um, but by the time you get to the golf course, they peter out. 
and you don't see them up here. So I think a fair bit of this geological mapping is uh, a little bit of guesswork, but it's buried under a lot of soil and things up here. There may be a few boreholes help you put, put the story together, but the, the subsurface bedrock geology is probably quite uncertain in that part. Anyway, fantastic sandstones laid down um, in the middle of a very large ancient continent by water. These weren't laid down in the sea, they were laid down in the middle of a continent. And part of the sequence is, includes things like salt, where the water's evaporated, and there's also shaley rocks as well. But that's a rather nice picture. You can see the layers and layers of sandstone uh, laid down back in uh, Triassic times. If you haven't been to St. Bees, I'm sure many people have, it's always a fantastic uh, trip, even if you don't look at the geology. Okay, now things get a bit more tricky as we go northeast um, beyond Maryport. So um, I've jumped actually quite a long way northeast in this picture. I just quite like this little Google Earth picture, which shows um, the peat deposits, actually, which I mentioned earlier on um, the mosses up in the north there, uh, only about 10,000 years old. But there's very little in the way of an outcrop. Um, so you don't get, the old houses up here weren't, weren't stone built. They were, was it Dabin? I, somebody will tell me. Um, they had to build from different materials up here because all the rock, as I say, peters out at Maryport. It disappears under the, all these nice soils with all the agriculture. So we get a different style of geological map I've used up in the north here. There's Maryport. And this is basically all the different soils, the superficial deposits. Now we know what's at depth because it's like the Triassic sandstone mainly, I think. We've got nice yellow is the alluvium down the river valleys. Bright green is the blown sand south of Silith. This brownish color is alluvium. Um, and then we've got this pale greeny blue is all the glacial, glacial deposits. So completely different geology and landscape once you get uh, northeast of Maryport. I just like the picture of Groon Point. Um, I think we've got mobile uh, marine deposits here and probably some windblown sand, which has given us this, the spine here. Um, and a nice view across to our chums in Scotland at Creffel there. Not a sign of a decent bit of rock anywhere. Mentioned the mosses, fantastic, interesting landscape. Worth a visit if you haven't done it. I suspect most people have, but um, as I say, young geology actually. Salt marsh, completely different terrain. Um, some of it's intertidal, some of it floods. Often uh, very soft and, and young, young muds. Is it temporary geology? Will it survive? I don't know. But I regard it anyway as a geological formation. And there's more around Carlisle. You can get the idea. When it says I fished here, I didn't fish here. I just pinched this online. Somebody else fished there. But it, it just shows the, the general low-lying terrain, no sign of rock. Uh, and not, not very far above sea level, most of it, actually. I was out today, actually. I was out, out just with my grandson on, on this hill over here. He didn't make it to the top. He's not even two yet, so his little legs got tired. But um, these artificial geology, man-made, person-made, let's get it right. Um, and I call it industrial landforming. So it's blast furnace slag from the uh, heyday of steel making in Western Cumbria, which is linked to the local iron deposits inland and the abundance of coal, which we've heard about already. This blast, blast furnace slag uh, had a tremendous influence on the landscape on this part of the coast. Uh, let's call it uh, south, uh, west and, and south of Workington. And they look for all well, like natural cliffs. And if you look at the little picture on the right here, uh, on the left, sorry, um, some of these pieces look like volcanic lava, which is kind of what they are, um, except they come out of a, a blast furnace. So I just wanted to give a, a broader view. I've got this phrase deep time, you have to excuse me, but um, I go back quite a long way just now. This is the last, I'm about to finish, this is the technical bit. Um, let's see, if I could draw your attention to this circular view of the globe top left that's the late Silurian which is the age of some of the rocks that Nick's going to talk about actually um, the world as it looked 420 million years ago 
And you can see that England and parts of the uh, Southern Ireland anyway, uh, are a separate mini continent. And, and what's now Scotland and most of the rest of Ireland was another continent. And you may be familiar with plate tectonics or not, but continents over geological time move around. And at the time, we're well south of the equator. Now, it didn't look anything like it does today, of course. It was a completely different continent. And um, the Skiddaw rocks that we talked about were deposited in the sea off the north edge of this continent. And some of the ones that Nick's going to talk about were deposited in the sea off the south edge of that continent. Um, what's now the Solway, Solway Basin, or the, the, the narrow Solway, is shown in this major cross-sectional diagram here, the red arrow, that's the width of it. You see the Lake District runs down here to the south-ish. Um, and then you've got uh, the Southern Uplands geology on, on the Scottish side, clearly. And a rather interesting diagonal black line. This is the line where two continents collided something around 400 million years ago. Um, the, the oceans between have disappeared. They've been pushed mostly underneath the, uh, the ancient continents. and. Uh, so Scotland and England are more or less separated by this ancient, it's a, call it a suture. Anyway, it's a joining point uh, where the ancient continents collided. Um, and that's one reason why the geology is completely different on the Scottish side from the English side. They started off in different continents. They happen to be close together nowadays. Okay, that was my technical bit. And I'm going to pause there. Um, we'll take some questions later on. But um, it's my job to uh, hand over to Nick, I think. It's all yours, Nick. Thank you, Phil. I'll just share my screen. Uh, oh, that's not quite what I was expecting. Let's just start from there. So yes, this second part of the presentation takes a look at places on the Scottish side of the Solway that reveal the amazing rocks that shape our coast. And as Phil has just mentioned, um, the rocks on both sides are, are quite different and the rocks that are deep beneath the sea yeah, or the, the land in, in England are exposed on our shore here uh, at Back Bay of Monreith. Uh, a quick refresher on the uh, geology map of the North Solway. The green color are the sedimentary sandstones laid down in that ocean about 440 million years ago. Uh, the red blobs are granite intrusions. And then you can see along the coast that there's a, a light blue slither that are sedimentary rocks that are laid down in tropical shores about 340 million years ago. So the rocky shores that we have give us a peek at what lies beneath our feet further inland. And some places have spectacular uh, landscapes, such as this is uh, Needle's Eye near Sandy Hills. The granite outcrops between Rockcliffe and Ocken Cairn uh, form surprisingly modest cliffs, but these are what attracted a geologist over 200 years ago. James Hutton wanted to test his theory that granite was once in a molten state. And he traveled around Scotland with his friend, John Clark, and they were looking for veins of granite penetrating into surrounding rock. Uh, this illustration is from his journal and shows a vein that he was looking at near Cretown. Like many of us who visit Galloway, uh, he was drawn to the coast and uh, he went to Sandy Hills. Uh, I don't think he was sunbathing. He was looking at the cliffs just at the background there, which have uh, granite in them. And there he found proof that granite forced its way up through older rock. So Hutton changed the way we think about geology. Uh, he had a theory of uniformitarianism. It's a long word. Uh, but basically, it just shows us that processes that uh, can be seen today are reflected in those that we can see in the geology of the past. 
So when we have a look at uh, ripples on the shore like this, we can also find those same ripples in geology in stone that is exposed. So this is uh, the, the sandstone that was laid down deep in the ocean floor. And you can see the, the ripples that show that it was once at the bottom of the sea. This is uh, in fact at Rock Cliff, but uh, you, can, you can see it in almost all the exposures of these stones. Another great geologist was Charles Lapworth, and uh, he lived in Moffat and spent a lot of time studying graptolites. These were tiny little scratches in, in the rocks, but they evolve over time and change. And his studying meant that uh, uh, in the shales that he, he recognized that he could look at these and work out the sequence of layers of rocks. And really it was his work that explained and showed people what the different layers were and that, that these were once in the deep ocean. And here they've been um, upended and that happened when these two continents collided. So the, the seafloor was scraped up and stacked and folded and to create massive mountains that were the southern uplands or are now the southern uplands. And these rocks can be seen um, all along the coast and have this uh, the, the sea floor is is now vertically in the cliffs, making wonderful places for people to climb. Not so good if you're a nesting seabird because of all the rocks are, are pointing up the way. As we go further east, then we come uh, across this slither of Carboniferous rocks. And these were created on uh, tropical seas and laid down in, in the time when the seas were changing. So we had shallow seas um, and swampy land. And uh, sometimes we get these larger stones that are fixed in uh, finer materials. And this is known as conglomerate or pudding stone and can be found on the Coal Bend coast as seen in this picture. So this tropical shore uh, changed over time and there was a sequence of um, fluctuating between shallow seas and swampy lagoons. And in these were laid down limestones and mudstones and sandstones. And these different layers can be seen on, on the coast. Uh, this is the Thirlstone Arch at Pau Willemont. Uh, this is a sandstone here. But also in this area, we can find lots of fossils. So uh, there's lots of corals and shells and uh, also fragments of plants. So this here is a, a stem of an ancient tree fern. And these same, same rocks have been used by people to build buildings, great and small. These are the sandstones that have been used in Dundrennan Abbey. And they've also provided us with, with other materials. So for industrial use, uh, this is an amazing place at Ed's Point near Ockenken and is a millstone quarry, but it was an intertidal millstone quarry. Uh, First, it might seem a bit odd that, that people quarried stone from a place that half the time was covered in sea, but I think there was method in their madness. Um, there was two benefits. One was that uh, you could drill holes and put dry timber into the holes. And then when the sea came back in, it swelled the timber and split the rock. But the other thing was uh, when you're cutting out something as big as a millstone, then to have it on the shore, you could very easily load it into ships and export it elsewhere. There are many veins, mineral veins in the area, and there are a lot of copper mines on the coast, ancient copper mines. There was never very much mined from them, but uh, it didn't stop people searching and, and taking out what they could. Uh, one of the minerals that is also in the same area is barites. So um, 
this is a, a, a heavy material and is used for various different things, um, used in paint and used as a, as a kind of weighting material uh, and, and used in the oil industry. In fact, uh, it's even in used in playing cards to give them that bit of weight so that you can deal them easier. And well, certainly surprisingly for me, uh, the most interesting is that there are also outcrops of uh, rocks that have uranium in them. So this is Lot's wife and there's another needle's eye just behind there. This is at Merce Head. And uh, these shapes have been created by, by the seas in the past. Uh, and this is where the uranium is, uh, although not in big enough quantities to be exploited. So as Phil's already mentioned, the landscape that we see today has largely been shaped by ice. So glaciers have uh, ground out the shape of the ground land. And in doing so, they've uh, gouged out and transported rock and material. And some boulders have been moved great distances. So uh, this here well, explains erratics like this one here, which is a granite boulder which is sitting on Carboniferous rocks. Uh, other people have different opinions as to how this occurred. Uh, it's called the Devil Stain, and that's because it's thought that the devil came along and took a big mouthful out of Criffle, and unsurprisingly, it didn't taste very good, so he spat it out onto the shore here. And uh, people point out that it must be true, because if you go to that rock there, you can see his teeth marks along the top of the stone. Some stones we find on beaches are actually distinctive enough to be able to be traced back to their place of origin. So this in the West, you can often find pebbles of a bluish speckled microgranite, and this can be traced to Elsa Craig. So we know that this pebble has been moved by ice from Elsa Craig to a, to a beach on Galloway. Occasionally tricks are played on us. This is Flint Bay in Kukubri Bay. And uh, well, there certainly are lots of flints there, but they haven't been moved there by any geological process. In fact, there was a ship wrecked there and it was carrying flints on the ship. And so the stone there is actually uh, a result of the shipwreck rather than any geological process. So as the glaciers moved along, they ground up rock and stones and transported it. And then when the ice melted, it, it left a layer all over the land and but can also be often exposed on the coast. And fluctuating sea levels from that time has also left many shore deposits like this at Newby Hills. And occasionally you find strange things in, in these deposits. So this is a, a big bone that I found on the shore. I was a bit worried that maybe it was a, an elephant that got out of its depth. But uh, there's been some tests done and it has been shown to be a mammoth thigh bone, although we don't yet have uh, a date or it hasn't been carbon dated yet, but we're hoping to get the results for that soon. So that was a really quick zoom through uh, what I hope is an inspirational coastline. And I will now uh, hand over back to Claire and Naomi so that she, they can ask questions. Ah, here we are. Great, um, thank you very much. That was uh, that was really good, and that was a, a quick, a nice to have a whistle stop tour of both sides of the Solway. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions that actually Phil, Phil's already answered on the Q and A, but we'll just go through them because I suspect that not everybody will have seen the kind of answers. So there was uh, the first question was from Steve. Um, and he was asking what the blue dots on the glaciation map were. So Phil, if you wouldn't mind 
um, answering that one again, just for everybody else that might not have got that answer. Okay, I answered these ones as they came in and listening to Nick at the sure. same time. Yeah, the blue dots are, uh, on the glaciation map, I compare them to um, watersheds. I think the, the, the lines of dots represent, let's call them glacier sheds. So they show the, the break of country or the high bit of country where the glaciers go from, let's say, go, some go to the east and some go to the right. So I think that's all they were, those blue dots. And I think the arrows play to that, that theory. You get difficult questions like this when you just pinch um, pictures off the internet, which is what I did. But um, <laughs> Thank you. No, that's fine. Thanks. Naomi, I'll pass over to you. Uh, sorry, shall I? Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to find it. Um, we had a second question as well um, from Anne um, around um, the rocky scars or scores. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce them, actually. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm sure. Wait, um, so, um, said to be glacial deposits, and yeah. she said that the groom is partly made of this too. Wondered if you had any further explanations. Um, sorry, it says my internet connection is a little unstable, so apologies if it's a bit funny. Uh, second, secondary question from Anne is... Um, the huge limestone boulders, which are used as rock armour on lots of parts of the Cumbrian coast, and um, she wondered where they came from. So there's kind of two sections to that question. But if you could just explain that again, Phil, I know you've already answered it. Well, OK, yes. OK, a couple of things there. Um, yes, there are glacial deposits, mounds of glacial deposits called drumlins. I wouldn't be at all surprised if there isn't one um, helping to form that landscape at Groon Point, but I can't give it a definitive answer uh, either way. Um, on the limestone, yeah, there's limestone boulders all along the Cumbrian coast for rock armour, uh, and there are several big limestone quarries in western Cumbria. There's a rather large one near Frisington, there's another one near Mota, uh, there's one near Brigham, actually, where I live here, and they generally used pulverised as aggregate or roadstone or something, but they do get some nice big stones. Uh, which are big enough, you know, a couple of tons each, perhaps even um, for, for rock armoring. There is a, a, almost a circle of limestone right around the outside of the Lake District. And obviously, it doesn't quite make a circle because the sea gets in the way. But if you look at a geological map, there's a blue arc swings right round um, all the way from um, sort of near Whitehaven, right round in, towards the Pennines and right round in South Lakes. And it's because um, the limestone once probably covered the Lake District, but the middle bit has been domed up. Imagine it coming up in a big dome by as the crust gets distorted. The top's got eroded off, left this fantastic ring of limestone uh, around the Lake District. So I threw in a bit of Lake District geology there just for, just for free. <laughs> Great. Um, and so there's a question from Bill here, which I'll, uh, it's probably for both of you, but Nick, I'll ask you first. Is there anything particularly unique about the Solway that's not present anywhere else? So do you get the devil everywhere all across Britain, or is it just in the Solway that we have <laughs> the devil biting bits? No, the devil's <laughs> definitely everywhere. The devil's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not just in the House of Commons. Um, <laughs> he's obviously been up to Glasgow because it is is it the devil, devil's tail or somebody that calls the Wangi a geological feature up there? Yeah, <laughs> he's everywhere. Devil's tail, goodness me. Anything yeah. particularly that it's unique about the Solway? Do well, you know? I, I think certainly the um, seeing the rocks that have been upended by the collision of the two continents and, and so clearly visible in many of the cliffs on the Solway, and those create some spectacular seascapes or beachscapes that you can see. So I think that's probably. Yeah, they do, they do look quite amazing, don't they? Yeah. yeah, I'd echo that. The Scottish side, from a solid geology point of view, is really fantastic. Um, lots to see. Uh, and most of the rocks are up on end, uh, yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. I showed you some at St Bees. Um, they were after the collision of the continents, but the ones in Scotland got caught up in the collision of the continents, which is why they're all up on end. So it's not unique, um, but it's a very distinctive feature. Yeah. And there's lots of very distinctive features about the Solway. I'm sure it is altogether a, a unique environment. Great, thank you. It's together. Thanks. Uh, we've got, do you want me to go to the next one? We've got a couple more, yeah, um, a couple more questions here, which is really good. Um, the one from Jackie Haystwell. Um, it, this is one for Phil, really, but it may be um, applicable. Well, it will be, I'm sure it will be applicable to Nick as well. Can you recommend any good sites to go fossil hunting on the Cumbrian side of the Solway? 
I don't know if that's something that you know about, Phil. Uh, I'm not a big fossil buff, and I don't really approve of geological hammers, so excuse me, but I don't, it doesn't really matter what you do on the beach, because they just wreck things. If you have a hammer, you hit things. Um, if you look online at um, fossils and Parton, Parton is near Whitehaven, uh, there's a lot of fossils on the beach at Parton, which have largely come from the limestone that's been brought in, but apparently, somebody told me yesterday, I was, I was doing some geological mapping in the Lake District, Somebody just mentioned that they take their children there or others there just just to see what's what. So if you if you look online, um, there's a, there's a fossil hunting website. And I can't remember its name, but if you Google fossils in Parton, I've certainly what... been to Parton because um, I've got a brother who's a big fossil hunter, and, and he'd already found it from Denmark. That was the place to go. So we've certainly been there fossil hunting, but we didn't have any hammers with us. <laughs> no, it's okay. Well, at least I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I don't, I don't really care about beaches quite so much as I do classic outcrops in land which have got scientific interest and they need to be yeah. available to future generations. We just shouldn't just go smashing these things. So, um, Yeah, sure. I think that's an important point, isn't it, around con conservation yeah. as well. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, fossil hunting can be done completely without without hammers, um, just searching sort of, especially on the coastline on quarries or... Yeah. Um, but it's a really good point to say, you know, let's leave everything as we find it, find it really. Yeah. I, 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 I don't take film. any. I don't take any samples home now. Yeah. Um, early on, I did, and I found I got lots of old samples in the garage and never looked at them. That's <laughs> a shame, isn't it? Um, so, you know, leave only footsteps, or whatever they say. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And on, on the Scottish side, uh, there's hey. very few places that you can find fossils, but uh, the best place by far is between Powillamont, which is near Southern S, between there and Carsthorn where these carboniferous outcrops are. And uh, well, as has already been said, uh, you really shouldn't take a hammer along there to collect any, but there are plenty that are washed up on, on the shore there. And you can find corals and shells and bits of plant. And uh, yeah, it's well worth going to have a look just to see the corals in situ, but yes, please don't remove them. Yes, I mean, beware of the SSSIs and the AONBs. Naturally, they've all got sensible restrictions on them. So I'm a great believer in taking a camera and that's it. Mm -hmm. so Just fact, the, answer to that, the answer to that question is really, you've got to come over to the Scottish side and have a look yeah. at our corals. Absolutely. <laughs> sorry, um, Naomi. No, sorry, James, you jumped in there. Um, I'm, I'm just post a little comment in the chat um, to say lots of fossils in the limestone rock armour and pebbles on the west side of Groon Point. Um, yep. So obviously the, the um, limestones come from a little bit further afield, but um, yep. if you are wanting to go and have a look at that, that's a really good tip. So thank you, Anne, for that little tip. So uh, easy to get to if you're having a day out in Sillif as well. So. Yeah. And kind of uh, following on from, from that, actually there's yeah. a question from Alison in the chat about, do you think that the Grun is doomed ultimately? And if so, what sort of time frame would that be in? It's definitely doomed. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it for a few thousand years. I, I've got oh, no as idea. As long as that, right. Well, okay. I mean, the, 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 let's face it, the seashore changes twice a day. Um, and the, the back of the seashore changes with the storm several times a year. But um, I think the central part of it has got certainly hundreds of years in it. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to ad lib too much. So, um, but it's, it's clearly, I'd say the coastal part of it's probably getting deposited as fast as it's getting eroded just now. But geology, geology will catch up with it in the end. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions in the Q&A, but Naomi, did you have, have a question? <laughs> yep, <laughs> go on. <laughs> um, I'll just see that there's uh, another question. Um, a couple of oh. comments. Um, presumably, sorry, just an, an additional comment from Steve. Uh, Trotter, presumably Groon will move the sea level if the supply of sediment continues. So that's another comment there. I don't know if that's something to add to your answer or... Um... Sorry, I'm just... And, and, and also put in the, in the thing that she didn't actually use a hammer when she went to Groon with students. So I'm, I'm, pl I'm very pleased. Yeah. I'm very pleased. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so what was that? What was the sorry, last question? Um, it, sorry, Steve from Cumbria Wallet just said, presumably the Groom Point will move with the sea level if yeah. the supply of sediment continues. I'm assuming yeah, he's meaning yeah, that right. obviously you've got the um, the waver and the one pool kind of entering out. So there's quite yeah. a lot of coastal processes on Groom. Um, I think, well, that I think there is. To the fact that it all, you know, there's there's accretion and decretion um, as well going on. Is that absolutely? I'm sure it's quite dynamic. But um, at the core mm. of it, let's face it, it's got a, a 1940s pillbox which looks pretty good on top. Um, yeah. 
I think the core of it is there, but it'll change a lot around the edges. Um, but I say I don't mm. really want to ad lib uh, on live geomorphology, but it is it, it is a vulnerable area, and I'm sure it's getting deposited. Part of it as fast as getting eroded, but um, all these things, you know, bear in mind that the Lake District we're looking at has about three miles of rock has been worn off it over geological time. That's height. <laughs> so you know, uh, mm. bear that sort of thing in mind. We missed. Uh, there's a lot of land missing, but I'm yeah. sure I'm sure Groon's got certainly hundreds of years, if not if not thousands. But you know, I'm only ad living. Yeah. Do you want to go next, Claire? Because we've got a few more questions going in now, actually, which is really good. I think people are. Yeah, sure. So, so Helen was asking if there's any easy to read books published on the shape of the Solway coast, especially for the North Solway, but they live in the South as well. So I suppose that's just yeah, a recommendation of something that a beginner could perhaps yeah. pick up and. Yeah. Yeah. What have you um, got on your shelves, Phil? <laughs> I've, I've got my own book, of course, but I'm not going to sell you one just now. Um, <laughs> there's, um, obviously, I always say start with Google. There are excellent um, regional guides published by the British Geological Survey. Uh, there's one for Northern England and there's one for Southern Scotland. And they do get a bit technical, um, but they're beautifully produced uh, with lots of pointers for classic bits of geology to go and look at. So that's the easiest answer. But mm. also, as I say, um, look at the Solway Partnership uh, website, which I found rather good the other day. Um, you know, well, that's because not, 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 not Nick wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not being funny about it, but yeah, it's, you know, why not start there? And if you want to invest in some books, um, the, the British Geological Survey Regional Guides, and actually they publish all full marks and they publish all the text online as well, and most of the diagrams and photos. Mm. Um, I forgot, it's called Earthwise, I think. Um, so you can go and buy the book or you can go and look at all the pages. And, there's, a, um, there's also uh, an excellent uh, excursion guide for Southwest Scotland. And uh, it has some, it has different excursions to different places. And some of them uh, are much more geological and scientific than others. But, uh, but it's a really, really good book if you're wanting to find good sites to visit. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll find lots lots online, I think. But, yeah. um, and Anne has also put in, in the chat that there's always the fresh and the salt, the story of the subway by Anne Lingard. There we are. <laughs> so we'll just exactly. give that a bit of a push for Anne there. <laughs> <laughs> go, go for Anne. <laughs> and that's a you know, very human sort of landscape point of view. So actually, and quite seriously, um, if people are looking at, at something that is much more sort of holistic, then Anne's book is going to have kind of like lots and lots of um, that kind of stuff in it. So it'd be good, good port of call, really. Naomi, do you want to ask? Yeah, so it's my turn. Yeah, we, we've gone to pot, haven't we? For the, um, <laughs> the right, we're now we, we had a couple of questions in the chat. Let me just check that we haven't. Right, okay, we've got one more question because a couple of people have put something in the chat. Um, is there a difference in building styles um, and a quarry stone, building stone between the north side and the south side of the Solway first? So that's probably a question to both um, both panelists here, both speakers. Do you want to go first, Nick? Yep. So on the Scottish side, we because we've got this uh, sedimentary rock that has been uh upended it's it's actually a very hard brittle sandstone it's not really very good for building with and of course we've got the granites which are very hard to work with so um a lot of the buildings use sandstones and uh surprisingly actually well not surprisingly because it's only just across the sea quite a lot of uh, buildings are built with sandstone from the english side as well as the sandstones that are not really exposed on the coast, but are available in and around, say, Dumfries, Locker Briggs and, and that kind of thing. So th the buildings very much reflect the stones that are beneath the ground. But beware that there are some that are bought in that are, that are easier to use or, or look more handsome. Yeah, if I, if I could just talk about the English side, the, the, the obvious one, if you start thinking about it, is this reddish brown sandstone, which pops up on the Scottish side as well, which I think is what probably what Nick was talking about. Uh, the Triassic sandstone is a bit like the St. B's sandstone, in fact, including the St. B's sandstone. And it's used widely in Cumbria, and it's often mixed with the Lake District rocks. If you've got some places, you've got dark grey Lake District rocks in, in, in the National Park, and then you've got the coins down the side of the buildings are in red sandstone, or the lintels, or the window frames. So they get mixed, which is quite fun. Um, but that red sandstone finds its way around the world, Liverpool Cathedral, uh, United States. Um, it, it's, a, it's a quite a famous building stone and there's a whole raft of it goes off down the, the Eden 
uh, valley there as well and a huge amounts of it in central England um, but it does feature quite strongly um, in the local uh, building around here but my own house is made out of a carboniferous sandstone uh, which is slightly older and it's, it's, it's grey um, I just live near the, near the limestone actually um, but my house is mostly a grey carboniferous limestone and most of the houses around here are but if they're not rendered you of, of, often can see um, bits of Lake District rocks mixed in. Um, so, so that's the story. It, it, okay. It's different on both sides of the Solway, yeah. but the red, the red and brown stuff you see everywhere. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question in the Q&A, which was from Donald, who is talking about a large boulder on the Portland shore, which its surface was covered in small, hard black bubbles. And he's just wondering if it was uraninite. Could that be possible? <laughs> Yes, I don't even know how to pronounce it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Some sort of uranium deposit, I imagine. <laughs> well, do you want to have a go, Nick? I think this is a tricky one, actually. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure. So uh, certainly the, the, out, the outcrop of the um, uranium-bearing rocks are mostly just around at, at Merce Head there um, at Needle's Eye. Um, and I think it's a sort of pitch blend. It's a sort of shiny black rock. Uh, so I'm not really sure what, what it is that's on the shore that, that Donald's speaking about. He does say he's got a photograph, but he's just not able to send it at the moment. Maybe you could send that to us um, later, Donald, and Nick can have a look, Nick can have a look at it. Yeah, that's, yeah, if you do that, then I'll, I can have yeah. a look. Okay. Is that all the questions? I, I, I have to answer my last five question. <laughs> Sorry, I think that's all the questions. Let me just check that I we think, haven't. Um... Well, there was one that I think we there was in this. Um, somebody was asking in the chat which of the one or two spots in each area would be the best for kind of a, a very yes. basic level geology to see, you know, to go with kind of like kids or, or young adults. Um, Nick, do you want to just give like a one? Yeah, I, I would say two two places. Go to Back Bay of Monreith, where you get these amazing cliffs, where you can really see the vertical strata, and there's uh, lots of interesting caves and wildlife to see there as well. So, but make sure you go at low tide, because otherwise you'll see nothing. And uh, the the other place would be to go along the the shore beyond Cast Thorn and have a look at the pebbles on the shore there and you're bound to find fossils of one kind or another but but maybe have a look up first to, to see what you're looking for because uh, it's easy to miss these sort of bits of coral and things like that. Great, thank you. Phil, what do you think? You're on mute, Phil. Well, on the Lake District side, I'd yeah. say, uh, just around the corner from the Solway, I go to St Bees um, Beach, um, uh, which is a brilliant spot. I, I'm there at least once a month just to get a nice bit of fresh air. But if you look at the sea, if you turn right, you've got the red sandstone cliffs of the Triassic and you can see all the bedding structures in it, which I'm not gonna try and describe by waving my hands around and something called sand volcanoes, which you can Google. Um, so looking, looking on the right-hand side, you've got the, uh, the Triassic sandstones. And of course they go for miles around the cliffs if you want to have a look and um, you can get up close and personal on the beach. If you go left, uh, you're passing these uh, endless landslips below the golf course, which shows a lot of glacial uh, sediments, um, sands and gravels and layers of coal. And uh, so you can look at landslip, which is quite an interesting thing to understand landslips and see a real one or, or many real ones. And um, it's something called a push moraine. And I'll let you Google what a push moraine is as well really quite an interesting glacial feature. So for a one-stop shop with ice cream at the end, go to St. Bees Beach. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I think we've covered, unless it's Naomi, have you got any other questions? Sorry. Yeah, it was just, um, I had a few questions up the sleeve, but I won't keep carry on with some of them for Sam. But just um, one of the things that came to mind is that, you know, with us, obviously, um, when we, as part of our work with the Solway Coast Day, when we would talk a lot about landscape conservation, and a lot of the, the time we focus a lot on nature conservation and kind of built heritage conservation, you know, is there anything that you can think um, that we should be, what in your view, what should we be looking to conserve from a geological point of view, really sort of within the Solway Coast Day and be, if anything? 
Um, that's really to fill, really. I don't know if it's a bit of a big question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I personally, I don't think it needs conserving. It can look after itself. But the foreshore <laughs> at, at Maryport is, is a fantastic thing. It, never mind geology, it's just sculptural in the sandstones. Yeah. Uh, I, re I recommend that to lots of people. If you haven't been, it's, take a look at it and just think of it as sculpture. Um, as I say, beyond that, not so easy. Um, clearly, the uh, the moss, the, the peats are already protected, I guess, I hope, um, because they're uh, features of value. Beyond that, I don't think there's anything particularly outstanding, apart from the fact it is an outstanding landscape. Got a nice picture of Groon there, for example. Mm -hmm. But I, off the cuff, I can't think of any actual sort of world-class things to protect um, that are that unique that you haven't got them somewhere else. But I say the peat and, and that sandstone is obviously a fantastic outcrop to see. That's great. Thank you. That's really useful. Useful to get your views on that, actually. So thanks very much. Uh, I think that's it for me. I don't know if that would be a good good sort of place to finish, Claire, unless you've got any yeah. questions. No, I think that's, that's fine. So, yeah, so I'll just like to say well, thanks very much Nick and Phil for kind of giving up your time your evening and a sunny evening as well to kind of um, spread that knowledge it's been really really fascinating and um, I'm sure there'll be kind of you know people kind of um, getting in touch to find out a bit more and I know there was certainly some one person in the chat asking about potential field trips so that might be something that we can perhaps follow up in future is trying to organize kind of a field trip to one or both sides of the Solway and uh, yeah, various people are saying thanks and that they've enjoyed it and it's been really useful. So um, yeah, I'm sure everybody has found it found it really good. Thank you. Naomi. It's been good fun, thanks. I, yeah, I think I found it really useful, just um, that whole fact about the two continents. And I always wondered why the Scottish side of the Solway and the English side is always so different. So that, that's been like a really interesting thing from my point of view to kind of learn that really. So. Um, the other thing is, I just want to say, just to do a little bit of a plug, really, from Phil's point of view, is that if you are interested, and a few people have posted that they'd like to find out a bit more about the geology of Cumbria um, and Solway, you can join the Cumberland Geological Society. Um, there is a, um, a website, and I'll just post that in the, in the chat to try and multitask, which is a difficulty. Just a good way to find out a bit more about the landscape as well. Um, I think that membership fees are pretty small, and there's lots of opportunities when things... Um, Get up and run again to kind of go out on field trips and things like that so um i think um hopefully yeah, you know we're to follow up we're currently planning a summer field trip season and i'm leading at least one of them um mostly in the lake district but we're trying to get outside the lake district as well so be great it's only 15 pounds i think to be a member it's a bargain yeah. what what can you buy 15 pounds now <laughs> just post Not it i'm going to post a link now i'll just post it to all panelists by mistake um so uh oh. Well, you've all got a link now anyway so um i don't know if there's anything on, on the scottish side nick do you have any geological societies on the um all so you're not sure you know no i don't know there oh, was there was a geological group but i don't know if it's still in existence yeah i'll have to find out we find out we maybe need to do something at solely for a partnership we maybe need to try and uh, work up a project for for doing more about coastal geology yeah That's what we need to do there you go. We've got a few actions there, haven't we? So, can I give so, you another? I give you another plug, Naomi. Um, of course, you can. We like um, them. for those no longer in full-time employment. Um, there's there's the U3A. There's the organisation mm -hmm. called U3A, um, which has geology groups, and certainly the Cockermouth one is pretty busy. I used to run that one, and I'm still mm -hmm. active in it. So, there are various ways you can get involved in geology. <laughs> And, and field trips. And field trips don't have to be too scientific. They could be a nice day out. Somebody's having a go. The ice creams and St. Bees thing I can see there. So You're really selling it, Phil. I, 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 <laughs> you can tell I just, I just enjoy getting out and doing it. It's better than watching TV. Good to get out and about, isn't it, into the landscape. Yep. So, yeah, that's great. So... So just to sort of finally, um, we will finish in a minute. This is um, this, this is going to be the last for now of our monthly uh, or semi-monthly cross-border webinars. So, uh, you know, thank you for everyone who's come along to some of them. And um, we've had a fairly regular attendance. We've got the same people to uh, quite a lot of them and some really different people too, and some international, um, you know, um, people too, which is absolutely brilliant. So just decided to hold, to hold fire in it for now. It's a lighter night to hear. People can move around a little bit more. Um, so we'll see how we get on later in the year. But we really hope that you've enjoyed this programme. We really have, actually. Um, it's been a really, really interesting thing for us to do. 
Um, and just a quick reminder that if you've missed any of them over the last few months, you can watch them again on YouTube. There's a link on both the Solid Earth Partnership websites and the Solid Coast a and websites to watch them again. Um, so any feedback you've got, just reply, um, post it here, um, or just reply to our um, info at Solid Coast a and um, uh, address um, or Facebook. Yeah. Um, sorry, say for Claire. <laughs> get that in there. <laughs> Are we fighting, aren't we, the girl? Um, and just finally, we hope you've really enjoyed it and we hope you have a really lovely summer with lots of sunshine and getting out and about and feeling inspired by the landscape on both sides of the Solway. Thanks to our speakers as well. It's been great. Yeah. And just finally, if anybody has any topics that they'd really like us to do some webinars on, maybe next autumn, winter, then feel free to give us a shout and make some suggestions and we'll try and get some speakers organised for you. Great. Thank you very much. So have a safe rest of the I always say safe journey home but of course nobody's really journeying home but have a nice rest of the evening and we'll see you sometime soon bye thank you bye, bye everyone bye. Thanks very much. Nice. good night bye good night